Turn my morning dancing. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the
God, we welcome you into this place. We worship you and we honor you. And God, we ask you to be here with us today. When you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. When you walk into the room, every heart starts burning, and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. We worship you. Just sing this in worship. We love you, God. We love you and we'll never stop, can't live without you, Jesus. We love you and we can't get enough, all this is for you, Jesus. into the room sickness starts to vanish every hopeless situation ceases to exist and when you walk into the room the dead begin to rise because there's resurrection life in all you do season of fasting I want you to right now just give it all to him and say God whatever you want you can have God I sacrifice it for you God use me as you want to so come and consume God all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you we want you come and consume all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you more than anything we want you oh come and consume god all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you
Well, good morning, church. Last week was something for everybody, right? If you like snow, you got a little bit. If you didn't like snow, you were happy we didn't get three to five inches. Great week, right? All right. Many times in life, it depends on what your perspective is, right? That's good. All right. We're going to receive our offering now. There's two ways that you can give here. Uh, you can give via the PushPay app. You can give on the church website. That's kind of... But let me share a scripture with you. Luke 6, 38. And this is in red. It says, give... This is Jesus speaking. Give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. Now, some people... They've like shot away from this kind of thing because people have made mistakes when it comes to giving and church and all that, right? People have made mistakes. But let me ask you a question. Have people ever made mistakes with just church in general or with marriage or with kids or with a lot of things? So just because somebody else make a, makes a mistake, don't let that dissuade you from what God's word says. That's good. Amen. That's really now, good. let me tell you why this is important. See, some, some people have had the attitude that says, well, God, just give us enough and we'll be happy. Thank God that you have enough, but what about somebody else? Has God called us to be a blessing for just you or has God called us to be a blessing to people in the world? Others, yeah. I read a great example of that this week in my daily Bible reading. Just reading now been through the book of Joshua and how the Israelites went into the promised land. And in this story, it says that the, the tribe of Simeon that they lived amongst the tribe of Judah because Judah had too much. And see, what you need to understand is and why the too much, why the overflow is important because that's the part that you can take and be a blessing to other people. That's really good. Really good. See, that's why you don't want to, ju don't just stop saying, well, God, just help us get what we need and then just stop there. Say, God, give me an overflow so that I can then turn Amen. around and be a blessing to other people. That's good. Amen. Now, with that thought in mind, we like to put God's Word into practice here, right? Yes. With that thought in mind, you know, we have a food bank. If you, We have boxes ready that we want you to take today and to give to people because we have too much. And you know what? We want to take that and we want to give it out, and out to people and you can be our hands to do that. So let's pray and then Pastor Jace will let you go. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for a vision that aligns with your Word. Father, a vision of too much, not just so that we can have a big pile of stuff, but, Father, so that we can take that overflow and be your hands in the world. We ask you to give that to us. Father, we thank you for wisdom and using what we have. And, Lord, we just look forward to you because we know that your kingdom is advancing and we're advancing along with it. We love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We're in the midst of a 21-day fast. We are on day eight day eight. So we are getting through this. If you want to find out more about this fast, if you would love to join us and be a part of this fast, we'd love for you to st hang out after service for just a little bit and check out the video announcements so that you can find out a lot more about what we're doing. But for right now, let's jump back in to worship. You give life
shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great Trade 
you're always a place for us to come whatever weight we bear whatever sin we carry whatever concern we have you're a God we can come to and you'll take it from us in the name of Jesus amen and amen can you give God a great big hand clap for being just that kind of God you all can be seated My name is Pastor Jason. Happy New Year to you all. It is so good to be back here with you uh, today. I, uh, I, uh, my family and I were on vacation. I was about to say I missed you guys last week, but I'm just going to be honest. We were on vacation, and we were having a good time. But didn't Pastor Jace do a great job last Sunday? Didn't that boy preach fire? You know, um, just, just being honest. Uh, when I, I, saw, I saw the service and, and participated online, um, it's so cool that Pastor Mark's able to do that for us, by the way. Right now, live, our Facebook Live is going out. You should share that from our Facebook page with your friends, by the way, so they can see what's happening here. But in this season of corona, you, you as a pastor, get a little nervous asking how many people were at church today. Because, you know, it, it used to be that I would get numbers in the hundreds you know, and last week I got back the number that there were a hundred people at church. And I got to be honest, I'm just human. And I was like, oh, I'd be so glad for this to be over. So and, and it's only a hundred people. And the Lord just sort of rebuked me. Does the Lord ever rebuke you? 
Like, no, you shouldn't be thinking like that, you know? Like, I'm the, I'll just be honest. I'm the pastor, and the Lord rebuked me. And the Lord said, stop that thinking. And the Lord said, that hundred is your army. That, that God had to get us to this hundred so that we could become a thousand. And, and, and so look at the person next to you and tell them, you're in the army. You're, you're part of the army that's going to bring about the revival that God is going to use this church to accomplish for his kingdom. You're in the army. And, and so that excited me. So I, it was like I went from a low point to a high point because God's building an army. When I was growing up in the little Pentecostal church I grew up in, we would sing a song called God's Got an Army. And uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. You are, we are the army. And, and so as I began thinking about that, the Lord, as we push towards our March 21st relaunch, where we are going to relaunch this church as Renaissance Church, it's going to be it's a rebirth, really. Um, and we're going to relaunch our kids' ministries that day as Glow Kids, and then our new youth facility will be available. You should check that out, see all that's going on back there. We're going to relaunch our, our, our youth ministry that day as well. But the Lord has charged me to finish building His army. How do we do that? We do that through our partnership, uh, our partnership push. And, and so what is partnership at this church? We have right now right at 80 covenant partners, 80 people who have said, I want to be part of the army that is being built at Renaissance Church. And that's, that's awesome. Um, 80 people who have said, I'm going to invest my time and my talent and my resources and my family into this church. But the Lord has just laid this number on our hearts of 120. Everybody say 120. There's a lot of biblical significance there I won't get into right now, but we are calling it the 120 partnership push. And, 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 and so this is what being a partner entails. There are four classes that we teach just about every Sunday, and they align with the mission statements of our church. Find family, there's a find family class. Pursue purpose, there's a pursue purpose class. Share your story and experience life change. They're taught on the first, second, third, and fourth Sundays. Every week, we teach those classes. And you do those four classes, and you agree to become our partner, and you're our partner. And we'll put your name up on our placard on the back wall and recognize you as our partner. I know right now from our staff that there are about 50 people who were one or two classes away. So we're so close. There are a lot of people who were maybe three classes away, and some of you need to jump in. I'm building an army. More importantly, God is building an army here. And I need 120 of us to jump in. Today, we're doing the fine family class and a little thing that we call lunch with the pastor. And so um, if you are new to our church or if you haven't done the class yet, I want to invite you to lunch with the pastor. It's a time where you can ask about the vision of our church, where we're going, who we're going to be, because God is doing something new. We're being reborn in the middle of all of this. But 120 people as our partners as we move towards our March the 21st relaunch. It's going to be great. One more real quick announcement. In the middle of all this fasting, I want to draw everybody's attention to the last Sunday of this fast, which will be Sunday, January the 24th. I'm calling it Resurrection Sunday. It's the Sunday where we come back to life because first we get to eat. Um, and that's going to be awesome. We're going to have breakfast here for you all. But in here, God's going to show up and bring things back to life. Our end of fast services are always just amazing. And so if you've got something in your life that needs to be resurrected, a marriage, uh, finances, whatever, health, show up that day. It's Resurrection Sunday. If you know people who have things in their lives that need to be resurrected, invite them to church that day so that you can see resurrection in their life. Resurrection Sunday. All right, that's the end of my announcements. Are you all ready for the Word of God this morning? All right, all right. So, I, um, it's always, it's the first time I've preached to you all this year. It's always challenging. What do you, what do you say the first time you preach in a new year? Uh, and, and I know I'm supposed to be inspirational and talk to you all about all the great things that God is going to do this year. 
and, and give you hope about this coming year. But can I just be honest? I can't stop thinking about what we've lived through in the last year. I thought I knew what I was going to preach about today. And, and then the past few days happened. And God completely changed me. Changed my, changed my message. Because we've been through a lot this last year. Right? It's been a hard year. Really hard year. And I think we can all admit, as a society, we have not dealt well with it. Can I get a witness? We've not dealt with it. And, and another thing I know is, it's so easy to point at how other people are not dealing well with it. And, and, and it distracts us from how we're not dealing well with it. You know? A lot of times before we talk about we, we need to talk about me. And I got to thinking, how have I dealt with this past year? And I'll ask you that question. How have you dealt with this past year? You dealt well with it? Have you made God proud? Really? This past year, we have seen a once-in-a-century pandemic. How did you deal with the pandemic? Have you made God proud? Or have you done some things you wish you could take back? This past year, we have seen the most contentious presidential election in our history. How did you deal with it? Did you make God proud? Did you love people? This past year, I read an article this, this past week, we have seen racial division spike to a 50-year high in our country. How have you dealt with the racial division? Not they, you. Have you made God proud? This past week, people invaded the hallowed grounds of our nation's capital. Something I never thought I would see. How did you deal with that? Have you made God proud? Really? It's been a hard year, right? God uses hard times, though. God never lets a hard time go to waste. God says, I'm working every hard time for your good. What's the good God is using here? Sometimes God will use hard times to show us where we're weak at. You know, like, I love playing basketball. You all know that I talk about basketball a lot. I love playing basketball. Um, I've gotten to where I like watching basketball more than I love playing basketball because I've gotten older. But I love playing basketball. And when I was growing up, I was, I was pretty good. Um, with my right hand, anyway. My right hand was really strong. I never worked on my left hand because my right hand was just so strong. Until I played a team with a coach that was a really good coach, and their game plan was to force me to go left. But I couldn't go left. And so we played this really hard team that had a game plan for my weakness, and in the middle of my weakness, I was completely neutralized. I was a terrible player because the hard team exposed where I was weak and made me go left. And I wonder if that's what God has been doing this last year. I wonder if God has been forcing us left. Showing us where we are weak at. Maybe we've become people we never thought we would be in our weakness. Maybe you've said things you shouldn't have said. Like if you looked at yourself a year ago and today, you would have never thought you would have done the things that you've done and, and, and made the mistakes that you've made. Because you've been forced to go left. I think a lot of us in the last year have realized that we're all bigger sinners than we thought we were. Not we, me. I, I think we all need to repent. 
I feel the Spirit of God in this room this morning. This past week, especially, there's been one Bible verse that's been floating through my mind over and over again. Maybe you know it. It's from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I want you to stand to your feet, and we're going to read it together. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, introduces itself to us in this way. It says... It says, if, everybody say if, if, if is a legal term, if is a condition preceded, if means if you do what I'm about to read to you, then you'll get the reward at the end of what I'm about to read to you, make sense? If you do this, then you will get that. Well, before I read to you the guts of the if, the guts of verse 14, let me just read to the end, let me skip to the end so that you can know what's at stake here. Verse 14 says, if... You do this, and at the end it says, Then I, your God, will heal your land. Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? Are there two or three people in the room who are ready for our land to be healed? I'm ready. I'm ready for our houses to be healed. I'm ready for this church to be healed. I'm ready for this nation to be healed. So now you know what's on the line. Healing. Revival. How do we get there? The verse says, If my people who are called by my name, that's us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Stop right here. That sounds a lot like what we are doing as a church. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. We're in the middle of a 21-day fast. We're seeking his face. It sounds like what we're going to be doing this Thursday evening at our deeper service that we're doing. You should show up for that at 7 o'clock as we go deeper into seeking the face of God. So we're doing that, but the verse isn't finished. It goes on. It says, if my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Ooh, I like how the Bible doesn't mince words, don't you? The Bible is not so politically correct after all. any, Any departure from the ways of God is wicked. Some translations here, instead of saying this, they say, and repent. Everybody say repent. 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 Welcome to week two of our re-series. The title of the message today is called Repent. And repent literally means to turn around and walk in the opposite direction of ways. See, we've got repentance all wrong. Not repentance. Repentance is not, I'm sorry, God, but I intend to do the same thing tomorrow. I know I'm going to do it again. That's not repentance. Am I preaching okay? Repentance is, I'm sorry, God, and I'm so sorry, I'm going to get up from where I'm at and walk in the complete opposite direction, never intending to do it again. Now, you may make a mistake because you're human. I get that. But that's what real repentance is. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent, then, everybody say then, here's the payoff, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. You want to know where revival comes from? Revival comes when comfortable people become so uncomfortable. Have you become uncomfortable lately? That's what God is using this time for. I'm telling you, revival comes when when comfortable people become so uncomfortable that they are willing to do an even more uncomfortable thing and repent so that we can see God heal. I'm talking this morning 
to people who need to repent. I come to you this morning with a message that John the Baptist had. You all know John the Baptist? He was the first cousin of Jesus. Before Jesus preached, John preached. And John had a really easy sermon. He had one sermon. I'm jealous of John the Baptist. The only thing he would ever say is repent. Everybody say repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Every day. And it's almost like John was saying, before you get to see Jesus, you got to repent. Before you get to enter the kingdom of heaven, you got to repent. So let's take a moment and let's pray. And then we're going to take a trip together. Father God, we come to you this morning. I come to you as the pastor of this church. And I ask you to light up all of our hearts this morning and show us where we need to repent. I pray that you make us so uncomfortable that you make repentance not an option. Give us the courage this morning to repent so that we can watch you heal our land. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen and amen. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. If you're taking notes, you should write this down. Write this. God has a plan for me. God has a plan for me. I, I, I don't know what God's plan for you is specifically. But I do know that generally, God's plan for you is a plan of incredible joy. God's plan for you is a plan where you are fulfilled in your life. God's plan for you is a plan where you don't feel guilty all the time. God's plan for you is a plan where you're not dreading the future. God has a plan for you. Everybody say, for me. For, for you, God has a plan. Now, I don't know what your plan is specifically. I know generally what it is. But, but let me talk about what God's original plan was for us. God's original plan was a garden. A, a, a garden. And you all probably know the story. God creates Adam and Eve and puts them in the middle of the garden. I reread the story this week. You know, God's original plan for us was one where we, would, we walked face to face with him. And so Adam and Eve, because they walked face to face with God, they didn't wonder. They didn't wonder if they should apply for that job on Indeed. Because God was right there. They could just ask him, right? In God's original plan, Adam and Eve didn't have to wonder if the plan was for them to move across the state to another, to another, to another county. Because they could just ask God. God was right there. That was God's plan. God's plan was a garden. I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know. Everybody, most people know Adam and Eve's story. But this past week, I reread the story and I saw something I'd never seen before. Because when the Bible talks about the garden that was God's original plan, the, the Bible gives a lot of attention to the water around the garden. Like a lot. The, the, the Bible says, for example, in those days it did not rain. But that God caused water to come up from the ground to water the garden. I thought, that's interesting. And then in another place it says, and God caused a great river to flow through the middle of the Garden of Eden. See, see this was God's original plan. It was, it was water in a garden. This is what we were created for, for the water. I find it very interesting that Jesus one time said, I am the 
water of life. Drink from me and you will never thirst again. So, so, so God's original plan for all of us was Eden. It was a garden. It was the water. Not being so thirsty so that I know that you're with me. Look at the person next to you and tell them, don't be so thirsty. Don't, don't, be, so, don't be so thirsty. And, and I think that there is a piece of Eden a piece of the water inside of all of us. There's a, there's a verse in the New Testament that says, God has put a little bit of heaven in our hearts so that we yearn for the day when we can be as we were made. I, I, I think that you know God has a plan for you. You can feel it. And listen, most of the dissatisfaction you will ever have in your life is because of the gap between where you are and God's plan for you. It's because you're thirsty for the water. You want the water. People know the plan. They, 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 they know there's a plan. People come to me for counseling a lot. It's part of my gig as a pastor. I, I counsel with people. And um, usually when people come for counseling, it's not because things are hunky-dory in their life, right? I mean, it takes a lot of courage to go see somebody, especially the pastor, about what's going on in your life. And a lot of times, well, and, 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 and so things aren't going according to the plan. And so a lot of times when, when people come, the reason things aren't going to the plan, not always, but a lot of times, is because there is sin in their life that is keeping them from God's plan for their life. Right? And, and, and you get that, you understand that, that God has a plan, but sin will cause you to miss out on God's plan for your life. Romans 3.23 says it like this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So sin will cause you to fall short. And so people come to me and things aren't going according to plan, I can't figure out why. And I'm like, well, I can tell, I can't necessarily call it out like this, but it's sin. And, and so... Whenever there's sin in a person's life and they come to me, I'll do this exercise with them. I'm talking about habitual sin, you know? And, um, and I'll just say, hey, close your eyes and I want you to tell me what God's plan for your life is. What do you see? And maybe if you want to, you can do that this morning. And these are real things that people have said to me. I once... And these from a while back, so nobody you all know. But once a man who was cheating on his wife, and I was counseling with him, he closed his eyes and he said, he said, I know. He said, this isn't God's plan. He said, God's plan, and my, I'm such a good husband, she brags about me. I, he said, I, I, I remember him saying this, he bra she brags about me to her friends, and my kids are proud of their daddy. He said, I can see it. I once counseled with a gay man and I had him close his eyes and he said, he said, I can see it. And I remember what he said because it shocked me. He said, this gay man said, I'm married to a woman and we've got a big family. He said, that's what I want. I once counseled with a lady who was, um, because of all the bad things in her life that had happened to her, she was just very abrasive, you know? And abrasive is a nice way of saying she was mean. <laughs> and mean is a nice way of saying she was something else, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, she, she closed her eyes, and she started crying, and she said, I can see it. She said, my walls aren't always up. And I like talking to people. And they like talking to me instead of about me. There's a plan for your life. There is. If you close your eyes, I'll bet you could see it. God had a plan. It was called Eden. The plan was the water. But then... 
sin comes along. The apple comes along. The fruit comes along. God said not to eat. The sponge comes along. And all of a sudden, the water looks up at the sponge, and the water thinks, ooh, that sponge looks sexy. The sponge looks fun. I bet I could have so much fun with that sponge. I mean, I know I'm in the water, and the water's great, but I've been in the water for so long, I just want to try something different. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I just want to break the monotony of being with my family for four months in a row. I want to try the sponge. And so the water chooses the sponge over the water. The water leaves that which the water is created for, for something that is artificial and fake. The water chooses sin. You know the story. Adam and Eve eat the fruit God said not to eat. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, it's, the Bible says this. The Bible says the moment they did it, their eyes were open. Pay attention to that. Their eyes were open. It's going to come back in a few moments. Their eyes were open. Their eyes were open. Their eyes were open. It's going to come back. Their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked and they covered up their nakedness with fig leaves. Their eyes were opened and they, they knew. They knew the thing they had just done was wrong. When you leave the water, you know I'm not in the water anymore. They knew Something inside of them told them. Just like something inside of you is telling you that this habit that you have, that you laugh off, this thing that you cover up, this personality flaw that you make off like it's cute, but it's sin. These things that you are doing in your life, something inside of you tells you this isn't right, this isn't part of the plan, this is the sponge. And it's keep, and you know. You know, sometimes people come to me, and like, you'll be surprised at the number of times people come to me, and they'll say something like, Pastor, you need to preach on this particular kind of sin. Like, not even just preach on sin, but you need to preach on this particular sin. You know, they'll say that. <laughs> I mean, it happens a lot. And usually... When people come to me and ask me to preach on a particular sin, one of a few things is happening. M maybe there is a person who is like three rows over, you know, so get really uncomfortable with the people who are three rows away from you right now, you know. There's a person who's like three rows over who they have found out through the grapevine. Church people gossip sometimes. I know that may be a surprise to you. Who is experiencing and committing that kind of sin. And they want me to preach on that kind of sin so that we can forget about their kind of sin. And so we can point out their kind of sin so that we can make them feel bad about their kind of sin so that we can feel better about the sin we are committing because nobody's paying attention to them anymore. And, and, and so maybe that's what's happening. Somebody three rows over. Or... Maybe they want me to preach on a particular kind of sin because somebody on their own row is sinning. Now get real uncomfortable with the people on your own row. Somebody on their own row is sinning and they want me to scream it from the stage so that they do not have to form an authentic personal relationship with the person on their own row and have a hard conversation across a dinner table with somebody. I'm preaching so good this morning. I'm glad I had a few weeks off. <laughs> By the way, guess which is more effective at helping people experience life change? Me screaming it from the stage or you saying it from across the dinner table? So stop. I, 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 you just need to stop asking me to do your job for you. You know? <laughs> Usually... When people ask me to preach on sin, they're asking me to preach about what people already know. Adam and Eve knew. And they know. People, people don't need churches 
constantly telling them to stop sinning. They don't. People need churches that will constantly tell them that whatever sin they are in, the grace of God is bigger. People need churches that will tell them that whatever it is that has pulled them away from the water, the water is always calling them back. People need churches to tell them that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. People, why are you not clapping for the grace of God? People need churches to tell them that the grace of God can choke out their sin. I want to hold this sponge under a little longer so that you get the point. People need churches to tell them that the water wins, that it's not even a close competition. People need churches to tell them that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. I wish you would give five seconds of praise to the grace of God. We've got the story wrong. The story is not the story of sin. We've been telling the wrong story. The story is, is the story of if we repent, there's grace. We've got to get the story right. I think it's dead now. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. The Bible says that they knew. They know. They know about their sin. What they need to be made aware of is the water. Not your judgment, not your condescension, but the water. And for those of you in sin this morning, the water calls. I am the water of life. Drink from me and you will never thirst again. Adam and Eve knew. Why did they know? Because the Bible said their eyes were opened. Remember that? Their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. In the original Hebrew, that phrase, their eyes were opened, it literally means their eyes were pried wide open like that. Like that. Like you're putting a contact lens in, you know? Like, like this is torture. Like right now, mm, under these lights, I can barely stand that. But, but this is what sin will do to you. Pry your eyes wide open. Sin will promise you to show you the world, but this is what sin does to you. Doesn't this look like so much fun? This is what sin does. This is how we torture people. Oh, gee, you know my husband sounds like so much fun. Doesn't it look like I'm having fun? Lying to my friends so that I can have a good time sounds like so much fun. Doesn't this look like so much fun? And the idea that is being communicated here is that sin will cause you to see things you should have never had to see. Some of you have seen stuff because of sin, because of your own sin and because of other people's sin that you should have never had to see. And it grieves the Holy Spirit that you've had to see it. Adam and Eve's eyes are pried wide open. And they see what they should have never seen. They are banished from the garden. And they never see God again. Their eyes are like this. But they never see God again. Your, your, your next message point. Is that sin will open your eyes wide shut you look like you see life but you're blind and they never saw God again their eyes were open wide shut this reminds me of a story I want to share with you as we close why don't you stand so I can share this with you And as you stand, let's stay in a holy moment because I believe God's about to do something here. There are these two guys. This is a true story, I promise. There are these two guys who are walking down the road 
and they're just talking, and all of a sudden this complete stranger, they, they see him and they just start talking to this stranger. And what they don't know is that the stranger is world famous. But they just start talking to this stranger like the, the stranger's a regular person. And it's a kind of a funny story. It's funny to me because there are things that you talk about with regular people that you might not want to talk about with a world famous person, you know? Like, there are things that I might want to talk about with you that I, that I might not want to talk about with, say, Oprah, you know? Right? Like, like with you, I can, you know, we can talk about anything. You can talk to me about it, and I can talk to you about anything. But I might not want to talk, about, talk to Oprah about how I really didn't like the last episode of Star Trek that just came out, you know? Because I don't want to know what a nerd I am. I want you to know I'm a nerd. We're just regular people, you know? And so they're having this conversation with this world-famous person, and they don't know it. By the way, the name of this world-famous person, in case you haven't guessed it, is Jesus. Jesus has just been resurrected. Jesus, who is more world-famous than Oprah could ever dream. Jesus, on the third day of, of, of his death, he's resurrected, and he's having this conversation. And these two people he's having the conversation with are his disciples. These are men who have spent time with Jesus, but they don't even recognize Jesus. It's like their eyes are open, wide shut, next to Jesus, but don't even know it. And I wonder, you can go ahead and play. And I wonder if maybe that's happening to you. This last year has caused you to lose sight of the Jesus right beside you. Blinded to Jesus. This story goes like this. It's from Luke chapter 24. Verse 13 says, That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus. They were going seven miles back from Jerusalem. So they were leaving Jerusalem, back from Jerusalem. Verse 14 says, as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. Put my undercover boss graphic up if you don't mind. The boss just showed up, and they don't even realize that it's Jesus because they're blind. And they're talking about things with Jesus that they would probably never say to Jesus' face. They're, like, they're talking about, was he even really the Messiah? I don't know. What do you think, complete stranger? It's kind of funny. They're also blind to their situation. Because remember, when Jesus was alive, Jesus consistently told his disciples of whom these men were counted that he was going to be dead for three days, but that's okay, suckers, because I'm coming back at the end of three days. Right? Over and over he told them that. Guess which day it is? Day three. And these men are leaving Jerusalem. These men are leaving the tomb. The tomb is in Jerusalem. And so their blindness is about to cause them not only to miss Jesus, but to miss the greatest miracle of their life. See, see, God healing you is about you being reunified with God. Not missing Jesus, but it's also about you living that abundant life about you experiencing his miracles. But that's okay. My favorite part of the story is verse 31. It says, their eyes were opened and they knew him. Hold up, wait a minute. Did you hear what I just said? Their eyes were what? Their eyes were what? Didn't we talk about that earlier? Their eyes were open, their eyes were open, their eyes were open, their eyes were, oh, the Bible is just so cool, you know? Adam and Eve, seeing and their eyes were open pride wide open but they were blind these two men are blind they meet Jesus their eyes are opened and they see Jesus see sin will cause you to pry your eyes wide open but sin will make you go blind Jesus will give you your sight back so that you can see Jesus how many of you can testify that you were one day walking around blind, living that blind life, but then Jesus showed up 
and the scales all fell off of your eyes. How many of you can testify right now that you were blind, but now you see? How many of you can testify that Jesus showed up and everything started to make more sense? Now how many? Now how many? Now how many of you can testify and be honest and say, this past year, the scales have come back. And I need to repent. Because I have sin in my life. Verse 33 has their story ending like this. And this is the altar call this morning. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. That's repentance. I'm going to get up and return. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Do you need to repent? Are you tired of the distance? Are you tired of the distance between where you are and God's plan? Do you need to repent? Do you need to get up and return? I'm going to open up this space up here around the stage that's traditionally just called an altar. And if you need to repent, I want to ask you to step forward as the band sings this song. I, I, and, and listen, I'm having you step forward to the altar space. Like this is a place where a space where life change happens, where people get saved, where people get healed, where people change and make decisions. There's something about this space up here that's special. The, there's an anointing up here, but there's also something I think very powerful. About, and 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 you saying publicly, I'm turning around. There's something about it that locks it in. Do you need to repent? Do you need to get up and return? If you do, I want you to come forward, stand on one of these stickers. I believe God wants to do something special here. I've done my part. Now the rest is on you and the Holy Spirit. Let's sing this song. If you want re to repent, come on forward. I need to repent of my sins. I'm talking to saved people and unsaved people. I need to repent. was the precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide With the precious blood of Jesus Christ say God is grieved right now and he's grieved by you and he's grieved by this church because his word of repentance has gone out and many of you are not being obedient God says I've given you a chance this is your chance come forward and repent I pray for your courage and I pray for your discomfort right now. Let's sing. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. For 
forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Mm. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he this question I ask it every Sunday are you saved are you where you're supposed to be with God not just have you asked God to forgive your sins but have you asked God into your heart where is your relationship at with him maybe you need to recommit yourself at the beginning of 2021 maybe you need to be saved for the first time I don't know want to be right. The Bible teaches that a moment of faith can begin the process of making you right. It's as easy as ABC. You admit you've done wrong things that you've sinned. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you confess that from this moment forward, He is the Lord of your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask, do you want to be saved? I'll just count to three and ask you to raise your hand saying, yes, I want to be saved. I want to pray that prayer. And leave your hand up. Be bold. I want to be saved. One, get ready to raise your hand. Two, three. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Is there anyone? a hand. Was there another? There's two hands. Hey, I appreciate your boldness. God does too. There's three. Hey, the three of you who just raised your hands, if you really meant it, I want you to come forward. If Listen, if you're around somebody with their hand raised, I want you to walk up here with them and pray with them, okay? As you walk up, we're going to clap for you. So the two of you over here, come on up and we're going to pray for you. Clap for these folks as they come forward to be saved. Can we get some folks to pray for them? Come on, come on. 
is a moment of boldness for you. I want to just lead you in this prayer. You can pray this in your own way, okay? God, I admit I've done wrong things. I've made mistakes and I've sinned and I'm sorry. I repent. Forgive me. Help me to live better. I promise you I will. I believe that your son Jesus died for me and was resurrected. And I confess that from this day forward, he's the Lord of my life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Give these ladies a hand. If y'all will go with these folks over here, we've got some gifts for you, okay? Just walk with Dennis and Jane, okay? All right. Hey, you all, confess these things through faith with me, and we'll see you next Sunday. Let's read these things together. I believe God's word about what I have, all that I can do, and who I can be. Therefore, I am physically fit, emotionally equipped, and financially free. The fight was over before it started.